Thank you for watching today's worship service from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Our message today is... You may remain seated. Our sermon text this morning is our gospel lesson, which was read before and will be referred to during the sermon. May the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Amen. Dear fellow heirs of God's blessed comfort, during this period of time between Christmas and New Year's, often many people will spend some time looking back on the events of the year that has just gone by. And there's certainly many things that we could look at and marvel at, many unique experiences from this past year. But one thing maybe you might have a chance to look back at as you look at photos, maybe scroll through Facebook, would be if there was a birth in your family. Maybe a, a brother or sister, aunt or uncle or a cousin uh, had a, a new baby this year. And if you're scrolling through and seeing those pictures, there's always that one picture, right? The first picture of mama or dad holding that new baby. And there's a, a huge smile on their face, just a, a grin from ear to ear. Maybe you can think of a few pictures that you have seen like that. Maybe this year, maybe in years past. Maybe you even know and remember that feeling of holding your child or a grandchild or a niece or nephew in your arms for the very first time. Here, this one that you've, you've waited so long to meet, the one that you, you've, you've just been so eager to see that little baby's face and get to hold them and touch them and care for them and hold them in your arms. You feel so incredibly blessed to finally be able to have that child of your own. Whether it's your first child or not, a different child, someone else's child, you, that feeling of joy is not one that you quickly forget. Well, Simeon and Anna that we read about in our gospel lesson, they weren't the parents of the child that they saw and held on that special day. But a lot like a proud papa, Simeon grabbed that child and, and held that dear child tightly in his arms and rejoiced. His reaction to seeing that baby, that baby Jesus, was so gushing, so filled with passion, and so extraordinary that it made Joseph and Mary marvel at what he was doing and what he was saying. And let's be honest, Mary and Joseph have already seen quite a few pretty amazing things in connection with this child. Simeon was just overjoyed that he got the privilege to hold the one, the one that God had promised all the way back since the Garden of Eden, the one believers had been waiting for for thousands of years, the one the ancient prophets had talked about and prophesied. But most importantly, most importantly, the point that I want to bring out today is that Simeon rejoiced because this was the one for him. It wasn't the pride of a papa that Simeon felt. It was the joy of a redeemed sinner. The same joy that you and I have today when we recognize that this child who was born is not just the savior of the world, not just the savior of all those people out there, but this savior is your savior and my savior too. So Joseph and Mary had taken the infant baby Jesus to the temple when he was just a little bit over a month old. The Jewish law back in those days required that they would come and make a sacrifice at the temple after the birth of a baby, and especially the firstborn son was supposed to be presented before the Lord. So already as an infant, Jesus, as you see several times in our gospel lesson, Jesus is obeying the requirements of the law. And Jesus would continue to perfectly keep all of the requirements in God's law for his entire life, perfectly obeying the commandments for us. He did, even as an infant, even as a baby, he did what we could not do. He became the perfect, spotless, innocent sacrifice that would atone for our sins with God. Because when he took all of our sins on himself on the cross, he also exchanged those for his righteousness. He gives us his perfect record 
of keeping God's commandments perfectly 100% of the time, Jesus, even as a one-month-old infant, kept God's law perfectly for you and for me. There were a lot of people there that day in the temple, coming in and out of the gates, offering sacrifices, praying, worshiping, listening to the word of God and praying. There in the temple, the, the greatest religious leaders of the Jewish faith would have been there, the scholars of the Bible, the people who had very eagerly read the Old Testament scriptures, taught those Old Testament scriptures to other people. But yet those priests, those experts in the law, they didn't pay any extra attention to this poor couple that just walked in with their infant. No throng of people flocked to see Mary and Joseph and crowd around them as they brought their baby Jesus into his temple. Think about that for a moment. Baby Jesus was being carried into his temple, the temple that belonged to him, that was built for him. It doesn't sound like even the people who heard Simeon's ramblings or Anna's praises came over to see this baby Jesus and see what all this commotion, all this business was about. The only two that we hear about who recognized the Savior from sin were these two old prophets. The prophecies from the Old Testament, they all pointed forward to this one, to this child who was going to come. This is the one that everyone who ever read the Bible should be waiting for. But it sounds like, from our gospel lesson, that pretty much everyone else, besides Simeon and Anna, just continued on their merry way. This was not the type of Savior that they were expecting to see. And still today, many people do not recognize how important Jesus' birth is for them. I watched a, a Christmas special on the Nativity one time, and the, the, the subtitle on the, the show was What's Fact, What's Fiction, and What's Faith? Sadly, about the only thing that the show identified as fact was that these people and these places like Bethlehem and Nazareth and Jerusalem and the temple and so forth did really exist. And everything else, all the other details, they just kind of left up to, to chance or kind of left, left it as an open question. They actually asked in the, in the show, does it really matter if Jesus was born of a virgin or not? Does it really matter if Mary and Joseph fled to Egypt to escape Herod, or maybe they just hid in Bethlehem and got out of the way. Does it really matter if Jesus was born in a, a stable or in a cave? Ultimately, the show said what really mattered was the message of peace and love that Jesus came as a teacher to teach to other people. The show and the people who wrote the show completely missed the importance of, of Jesus' birth. And that's why people like that are, are the, the people who are now glad that all the fuss about Christmas is over with and we can get back to our normal lives just living again. But for you and for me, the fuss about Jesus, the fuss about Christmas, it's never over. We recognize what a great miracle that God worked in order to provide for us the perfect Savior from our sin. He gave us his very own son to redeem us from sin. So don't let yourself be one of those people in the temple who pass by our Savior's birth yet again this year. And don't recognize that this child was born not just to be the Savior of the world, but to be your Savior and my Savior. He came to bring you salvation. That's one of the reasons why we spend so much time during Advent preparing. It can almost seem like it gets a little bit old, doesn't it? You have the, the end times where you're talking about Jesus coming for several weeks before you start Advent, and then Advent you keep hearing that message over and over again. He's coming, he's coming, prepare, get ready. Don't let him catch you sleeping. But there's a reason why, Christmas, why Christians have held on to those Advent services and Advent uh, traditions like the Advent wreath and Advent prayers and Advent calendars. Maybe you had an Advent calendar in your home. It's because we recognize 
the importance of preparing for our Savior's coming. But we're preparing for his coming in several different ways throughout that season of Advent. We prepared for the celebration of his coming as a baby at Bethlehem. We prepare also at the same time for his coming on the last day when he will come to take us to be with him in heaven. But there's a third coming that we want to prepare for, and that is his coming into our hearts as individuals. Not a third coming in time, but a, a third one that we count. We get our hearts ready for Jesus to come and rule in them. And so we sing at Christmas, Ah, dearest Jesus, holy child, prepare a bed soft undefiled within my heart, that it may be a quiet chamber kept for thee. And today is the day that we specifically celebrate that coming that he was born into my heart, that he came to me as my savior from sin. Oh yeah, sure, joy to the world, the Lord has come, let earth receive her king. But today we rejoice that God sent me a savior. Let me receive my king, the way that Simeon and Anna did, rejoicing in God's great gift to me as an individual. God revealed to those two elderly believers that this child was the promised Messiah. And Simeon praised God for what God had done for him. Yeah, this was the Savior of the world. But what a gift God gave to this old man that he got to see with his own eyes and hold in his own arms the fulfillment of his salvation, the promises of God, what his faith had rested on for so many years, he got to hold and touch and see. And so he praised God. Now Simeon, an old man, could die in peace because God had kept his promise to him to send him a savior. There's something else here that I don't want you to miss, something that I think is pretty neat. And I want to take you back to the Old Testament for a minute to the time when they were building this temple that Mary and Joseph and yes, even the infant Jesus were in on that day. It was 500 years earlier after the Israelites had returned from captivity in Babylon. Remember the city of Jerusalem and the temple itself had been completely destroyed by the Babylonians, it had been burned and all the stones knocked down and so forth. The Jews that came back to Jerusalem, they built the walls of the temple. Maybe you remember the accounts of Nehemiah and how he helped them rebuild the walls of the city. But the temple itself lay in ruins for years. The Israelites had a hard time getting to it and building back the, the walls, the, the building of the temple where they were, where God wanted them to worship. And so God sent them prophets like Nehemiah and Haggai who came and really scolded the people because, yes, it, it was difficult work that they were going to have to do to rebuild that. It was difficult because they had enemies who were challenging them and trying to stop them from doing the work. But most of all, God pointed out with those prophets that the people had lost their love for the Lord. They had lost their dedication to him and the love for his house. So those prophets came and scolded them and told them to get to work. But they also encouraged the people of Israel with beautiful promises as they finished the work of rebuilding God's place of worship. In the, the book of Haggai, God spoke to a man named Zerubbabel, who was governor of that group of Israelites that had returned from Babylon. And he told Zerubbabel, I will take you, my servant, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. God called Zerubbabel his signet ring, the seal that a king would have that would authenticate, that would show that this was his true word. Zerubbabel was the chosen descendant of David. And Mary and Joseph, who now stood in that temple 500 years later, were both descended from Zerubbabel. God kept his promise to Zerubbabel and the rest of the Israelites by sending a savior to Zerubbabel and through Zerubbabel, the savior Jesus was born. He was the proof that God would keep his promise. And God also promised something else, another wonderful 
gift to those people who were building the temple. The people who were there who remembered what Solomon's temple had looked like, that they had seen when they were just young children, they wept when they saw what the new temple was going to be and how it would look. Of course, nothing was going to compare to the beautiful temple that Solomon had built. You remember the, the accounts of it and how the inside, the walls were covered with the most expensive cedar from Lebanon, and then those walls and the floor and the ceiling were all covered with hammered gold. Solomon and his father David had saved up for years to make that place as beautiful, as extravagant as they could in order to honor the Lord and show their love for him. Well, of course, the Israelites coming back from captivity did not have those resources. They did not have the silver and the gold that Solomon and David were able to put into that temple. So, of course, they were sad to know that their temple would never amount, would never look as beautiful as the one that Solomon had built. But God had, God had a promise, a promise that this temple that they were building was actually going to outshine Solomon's temple. Listen to what he said. I will shake all nations and the desired of all nations will come. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place... I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. That's Haggai chapter 2. Just imagine, if you were those Israelites, if you were trying to build a church to give glory to God so that you would have a place to hear his word and worship him, but you were sad because you didn't have the resources, you didn't have the money, you didn't have all of the, the, the things available to make it as beautiful and as extravagant as some other churches around you, and you wanted to show your love for the Lord but you knew it would never amount to the beautiful churches that you've seen. And then God came, and he told you that he himself was going to walk in the aisles of your church, that he was going to sit in your pews, and that he was going to lay offerings on its altar. But you would be so overjoyed, you would get to work, and you would complete that work with excitement, with happiness and thankfulness. Remember that no temple in the history of the world had ever actually had a God in it. This temple that they were building in Zerubbabel's day was the only temple in the world that's ever actually had its God in it. And in this temple, in this place, God promised he would grant peace. Jesus is that peace who entered the walls of that temple and worshiped there. Now that wonderful temple where Jesus walked and where Mary and Joseph brought their sacrifices to the Lord, that temple has since been destroyed. It was destroyed only about 40 years after Jesus was there. But since God granted peace to the entire world through that temple, in that temple, he has now built new temples that he fills with his glory. Now the temples that Jesus entered, enters are the temples of your hearts. Now you are glorified as the temple of the Lord because he lives in you. He walked into your heart humbly, just like he walked or was carried into that temple so long ago. He walks into your heart quietly through the power of his simple word, the beautiful promises of the gospel, as he creates and strengthens faith through the work of the Holy Spirit in baptism. And so we glorify God with Simeon and Anna because the Lord has come into his temple. He has kept his promise. And now your Savior lives within your heart. Amen. Please stand. And God, who has reconciled you through Christ, Keep your faith established and firm to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Amen. Thank you for watching today's worship service from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Join us for worship at church, 
or watch our live stream Sunday mornings at 9 on Facebook and YouTube. God's blessings.